Hi there, this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. You're about to watch a video live stream event that we held in August of 2020 with key players in the online MBA space. Uh, but before it starts, I just wanted to let you know that we have an incredible resource of information and analysis on online MBA programs, from rankings to profiles of individual schools, to how much they cost, to whether they require GMATs or GREs, and a wealth of other information to help you make a really good and smart decision about which program to pursue. If you want to avail yourself of all those resources, go to poetsandquants.com. In the nav bar, you'll see a little tab for online MBAs. Go there, or you can go direct to online slash MBA slash hub backspace at poetsandquants.com. We're looking forward to seeing you. Enjoy the video. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants back again at Backstage, our online MBA admissions and program event. Uh, we had a full day yesterday, uh, quite a few panels, a lot of different schools. And I think what I come away with really is, you know, people might say, I'm in an online MBA program, or I'm going to apply to an online MBA program. Well, one online MBA program is nothing like another. Um, there are a vast number of varieties. Uh, in some, it's strictly online. Others have synchronous and asynchronous sessions, meaning live sessions on the internet. Others have in-resident sessions that are required. Uh, some are voluntary, some have no in-resident sessions. Um, some take quite some time to get the degree if you go at a normal pace. Others are shorter. Uh, the price points are all over the place. Um, it's, it's a very different game. Uh, and I think that that's great because there's incredible variety uh, to match what your needs are. Um, and the flexibility of these programs uh, is obvious, as I pointed out yesterday in the opening, which is why they've become so popular. Uh, and the technology has improved to the point where um, it makes it very easy to learn online. And the courses are completely designed for online learning, unlike a lot of the remote instruction that is going on at schools all over the world uh, due to the pandemic. You know, when, when a course goes online uh, abruptly, what it really is, is it's, it's the same teaching methods, the same course, and just, uh, you know, Zoom gets picked up. Uh, when you have an online course, it's designed from the ground up, uh, starting with the learning objectives for the students. And the faculty member asks himself or herself, okay, what do I need to do to achieve these learning objectives? Uh, faculty typically find that a lot of extraneous material gets uh, poured out of a, a course uh, and the stuff that goes in is directly related to those learning objectives. Also, the teaching online is very different than it would be on a Zoom session, remote instruction. Um, protagonists may be interviewed, there'll be video segments, there'll be lots of interventions uh, with the understanding that in the online space, people just don't sit for hours on end uh, in a Zoom webinar uh, watching courses or a, pr a professor lecture. So there are things like uh, polls and breakout rooms and team assignments in these video uh, segments uh, that interrupt the, the flow of a lecture or a discussion to keep people more permanently engaged in the learning. Uh, these are important distinctions if you're considering an online MBA program because it ain't what remote instruction is. Uh, much better, uh, much more intuitive, much more engaged, uh, much more collaborative, uh, both with your classmates and with uh, uh, the professors. So today we have another great lineup, uh, and our first panel is really indicative of that. Uh, we have uh, four leading schools. Uh, really world-class uh, universities and business schools uh, with online MBA programs. And in fact, um, we have two of the absolute best in Europe, i.e. business school, uh, which is basically in Madrid, Spain, and Imperial College in London, of course. 
Uh, and then on the American side, we have uh, Carnegie Mellon Tepper, uh, and we have Michigan Ross. Michigan Ross is a new entry, essentially, uh, to the online MBA space. What, what's interesting about both Tepper and Ross is that they have the highest ranked uh, full-time MBA programs in the United States who also have online MBA options. Uh, so it's a great uh, lineup of uh, schools and brands. Uh, and I should say IE was one of the pioneers of online learning many years ago uh, in Europe and had the first online MBA program in Europe. Um, each of these schools brings a unique philosophy and approach uh, to their programs. So it's gonna be a lot of fun to talk about how they view the market, how different their programs are. Uh, and then of course, after our webinar, uh, you'll be able to go into a breakout room with any one of the schools to ask whatever questions you want. Those breakout rooms are about a half hour long, uh, right after our webinar, which will run for about an hour. We can take some questions here if you'd like, um, but only a few because of the breakout rooms, which will allow you to ask much more detailed and uh, questions of our panelists. So I'm really looking forward to the day. And that, of course, that's only the first of what will be four different panels um, today, which will feature a lot of different schools. Um, and you can look at our, our programming guide uh, to see who's up when. Uh, my colleague Nathan will handle the next two webinars and then I'll come in at the end to handle our last one. Uh, really looking forward to it. And I think if you uh, had the chance to um, peek in yesterday for any of them, uh, I think you'll really see we're delivering tremendous amounts of information to you to make a more informed decision about where you should go. Uh, and also addressing, you know, some of the misgivings that people naturally have about online learning if they've never done it before, which is a really, I think, important part of the messaging uh, to get out there. All right, let me welcome our panelists. Let's bring them on. Great. There we are. Fantastic. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's good to see all of you, even though I'd rather do this in person. Zoom seems to be the way to do everything today. <laughs> so um, let's let's uh, introduce all of you. We have Anne Schoen. I hope I'm not screwing up the pronunciation of that. You're good. Now. All right, at Michigan Ross in Ann Arbor. Are you on campus or are you from home, at home? I'm actually on campus today. This is the first time I've set foot in the building since March. Wow, congratulations. We're, we're glad to have you then. Thanks. How about that? We have Joel McConnell, who is uh, Executive Director of Marketing, Recruitment, and Admissions at Imperial College uh, of London. Welcome. Hi, Just came back from a wonderful vacation. And uh, he is now quarantined for two weeks, I believe. <laughs> so you must be in your home or apartment. That I am, that I am. Uh, recently returned from a holiday to Spain and uh, back in London now, looking forward to our, our fall inductions in uh, September. Fantastic. And we have uh, Jessica Yevix. Is that how it's pronounced? That's wow, it. two for two. <laughs> um, who is director of the IE Miami Center. Um, I didn't even know IE has the Miami Center. How long has IE had that? Yes, that's a good question. The physical space has been here. It's been at least seven or eight years that we've had a physical office. We've had a presence in someone here for, for over, I think, 10 or 12 years. We've had someone here in the market. So we have three offices in the U.S., one's in New York, one's in L.A., and the other's here in, in Miami. Wow. You know, IE has a lot of far-flung offices um, to make contact with the school for its various programs. So we're happy to have you here. Uh, and then we have, last but not least, Gina uh, to Chetty. <laughs> Close. Close? <laughs> you know, okay. now I'm actually, despite my name, I'm actually Italian-American. I should know better, okay? <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Chiquetti. Chiquetti. <laughs> All right. Gina Chiquetti. You uh, were so doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Since my uh, mother's maiden name was Cesario, okay? Anyway, Associate Director of Master's Admissions at Carnegie Mellon Tepper. Welcome, everybody. We're really happy to have you. 
Uh, as I said before, these are four world-class institutions with world-class on online MBA programs. Uh, I want to go with the oldest program first, and I know that's at IE, right? Uh, I remember writing about the fact, you know, IE has long been an in innovative pioneer in business education. Uh, and in my profile of Santiago, the, the former dean who's now the president of IE, uh, I noted that IE was the first European school to have an online MBA option. How long has it been in existence? Yeah, thanks, John. So, so as you mentioned, we were one of the first online MBAs in Europe and actually in the space in general. Um, our first online MBA was actually in the early 2000s. So it's been about 20 years now. Um, the program has evolved quite a bit. I think like a lot of MBA programs, taking into account new trends, you know, things that are up and coming in different industries and allowing students to have those different courses. But then also as an online MBA, we've been able to advance the technological side and really give those students an even more immersive experience through the advances in technology. I've been in your magic room in Madrid. Okay. <laughs> so I know what you're talking about. We'll get into that a little bit later. It's, a, it's really a great teaching room. Um, it's it's um, very much like uh, uh, Harvard Business School's uh, lab uh, that I've also been in. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about the structure of your program. We're, we're gonna go through the basics first before we get into some other nitty gritty things. Absolutely. So I'd first start out by saying we have a number of different online MBA programs, depending on the profile of the student. I'm going to be talking about today kind of our, our flagship MBA program, our global online MBA program, just to kind of make things a little bit more simpler, not confuse anyone. But just so everyone knows, we have for, for people starting with three plus years of experience up to top executives. Uh, we have a program with Brown University that's a, a joint program with them. We call it a Beyond Business MBA program where Brown University kind of brings the humanities side to it and we bring the business. So just to give you that little disclaimer first, but I'm gonna be talking about our, our global online MBA. Um, so the structure of that program is what we call blended. And what we mean by blended is it combines face-to-face -face periods that happen in Madrid or in another international location with immersive online learning. So the online learning component is actually real-time learning. Um, I'm actually an alumni of the program myself, so uh, I could speak from that experience as well. There's not one minute doing the program that you won't know you're doing the program. So this is not a learn-as-you-go type of thing. This is Saturdays you have video conferences, they're live classes through this wow room that John was referring to, where you can raise your hand, you can present, you can ask questions, you have your video on. So you really are active in that kind of classroom setting. Then throughout the week, you have a discussion forum that's mandatory to participate in. So whether you're looking at some of the fundamentals of, of a different area or you're analyzing a, a case study, you're gonna be commenting and answering questions and participating in a discussion throughout the week. How long is the program? That's a great question as well. So that's also where the program has evolved. Typically, it's been just over a year. Uh, right now, the standard program is at 17 months. What we, one thing we have changed, and just to give some students a little bit more flexibility, is now if they'd like to extend the program, that last term, the program's broken into three terms, that last term they could actually extend it, take less classes, and they could do, complete the program in 24 months. So ah. anywhere from 17 to 24 months. And how many intakes a year do you have? For the Global Online MB, we have two. So we have one that's going to be starting now in the fall, and then we have another one that'll happen uh, spring around March. And you'll bring in how many in a typical uh, intake? Yeah, so in an intake, you can have anywhere from, you know, 60 to, in my intake, there are a little bit over 100 students. The class itself is going to be limited, you know, your direct section is going to be limited to about 30, 32 students. And that has to do with the interactiveness of the program. So no one wants to read 150 students' comments on a discussion board. Um, so in order to make it kind of more feasible and so that you're able to have that participation, the classes are limited to about 30 students. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Joel, what about Imperial? Imperial, uh, I believe, started their online MBA program. This is from vague memory now. I think around five, six years ago. Is that right? Yeah, a little more recently, but we have been sort of actively investing in EdTech for about 20 years as well. Uh, and we actually are one of the you know, founding members of the FOM Alliance, which uh, you know, I use a partner of as well, sort of one of the schools that's dedicated to high quality online uh, degree-based education. And uh, it's certainly not surprised that you've been investing in technology because, you know, Imperial is often thought of as sort of the uh, the MIT of Europe. 
I mean, it's a very uh, high tech engineering focused uh, school overall. And I would uh, expect just as at Carnegie Mellon, that's somewhat reflected in the uh, business school as well. Certainly. And, you know, when you look at the students that typically will join our global MBA, uh, so the top top percentages of previous sectors, uh, you know, prior to, to join the program really are STEM focused. And that's everything from sort of tech to healthcare to engineering and energy. Those typically be the, typically are the, uh, the sectors where our students come from. So the structure of your program is what? Our program lasts about two years. Uh, it's based on four core modules as well as pre-study modules. And you are able to take electives as well. Uh, and so again, uh, similar to other, other top programs, we are a cohort-based uh, program and students do work in syndicate groups as they work through their program as well. So highly interactive. And there is both face-to-face -face and online components of the program, as well as international experiences that students can decide to opt into uh, as sort of additional components to the core program. How many intakes do you have a year? We have two, one in September and one in January. Well, that makes it simple. And how many people come in at any given intake? Well, uh, last, the last intake we had was about 140 students, and we're shaping up to have about that same amount this uh, coming September as well. Uh-huh. That's great. Uh, are there in-residence sessions that are required? Yes. Uh, students who complete the program do need to come to the beginning and the end of the program. And there are additional peers they can participate in, in a, on a face-to-face -face basis uh, beyond, uh, beyond London as well. And so we host those events, or we did host those uh, sort of residential study right. modules around the world. Uh, we're sort of adapting that now based on sort of public health guidance uh, in the year ahead. Sure. How many classes have you graduated? Excellent question. Uh, we are looking, uh, double check on this, but I believe we're on our, uh, we're working towards our 20th class, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, online? Mm -hmm, for the, the global MBA. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, we'll go to Carnegie Mellon, which also has a blended program. It's, it's actually, as far as I know, it's the longest blended program. It's, uh, it takes three years, right, Gina? It does because it's a part-time um, online hybrid program. And so, so yeah. give us a sense of the structure. I mean, a key part of it is your access weekends because there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that that 60%, 60% of the learning is face-to-face -face in a class, a physical classroom, right? Then, so over those three years, you know, what's unique at Carnegie Mellon is we do mini semesters. So two minis equal a more traditional uh, fall or spring semester. So you have your synchronous classes throughout the week. And of course, you're, um, you know, working and then discussing projects with your classmates. But about that seven, eight week mark is when you come together for the access weekends. And I think that's what really makes our program unique. During that time, you're taking live classes. Um, so you're interacting with the faculty, your classmates, but also the leadership coaches and career services, any other advisors that weekend, which you should just wait for access weekends to, to make contact with them. But that is how our program structured. Again, it's the part-time program, which is why it's uh, just shy under three years. Right. And over the three year period, there would be how many access weekends that you would actually attend? An access weekend is Friday night to Sunday afternoon, right? Correct. So about four times a year, you um, will be coming to Pittsburgh the majority of the time. But we um, then also rotate between Silicon Valley, New York and D.C. as well. Right. So it's, it's, it's uh, for people who, you know, want uh, closer to an on campus experience. Um, the Carnegie Mellon blended approach does stand out. I mean, the other interesting thing to me about your program is that <clears throat> you have one set of admission standards, essentially, so that <clears throat> if someone wanted to transfer into your part-time program or your... Uh oh, I apologize. Um the feed. Um, but yes, yeah, so you could transfer from the part-time program into the full-time program very easily. We consider it 
one program at Tepper, but three different formats. And that's the full-time program, which is in-person, the online hybrid part-time program, and then an on-campus uh, part-time well, program as well. Okay, there you are, sorry. Well, we, we had a frozen screen, at least from my end. I don't know if we did uh, for everyone else, but I'm glad we're back. Uh, so what I was saying is that it's very much like an executive MBA program, uh, you know, included in the tuition is uh, lodging and meals uh, for all of those access weekends. Uh, so it's sort of a different beast, um, as so many online MBA programs are. Uh, and Michigan Ross is the newest kid on the block. Uh, I believe that you entered your fir first cohort online was two years ago. Yeah, actually, we're we're the newest player in the space of this of this uh, panel here. So we uh, brought in our first intake of students in fall of 2019, and just finished wrapping up our second intake. Um, and the exciting news for us is that we will begin taking students in a second intake. So, so far we have limited it to fall, but are now going to be accepting students this coming winter as well. Um, and our, our program does have residential components. So we have three requirements for in-person residencies as part of the program. And those uh, currently have been offered in Ann Arbor, but we do have plans to expand those to international locations in 2022. So that will allow us to uh, accept international students into the program this coming fall. And are those on weekends or are they, are they more involved in that? They're more involved in that. So there's a curricular component to the residency. So there will be extensive pre-work leading up to the in-person experience. And the in-person experience could vary, you know, maybe three to seven days, just kind of depending on, on the topic. And then there will be significant post-work um, after the in-person session as well. Right. And uh, there are live classes every week as well, right? Yes. On the internet. So, yeah, we are similar to, to Carnegie Mellon in that we are more of a part-time hybrid. Um, so all of our students for the most part are working full-time while doing the program. And, and so it does take them a significant amount of time to get through all 57 credit hours. So a typical time to degree for our student would probably be somewhere in the three to four year range if they were taking roughly two classes in a, in a full semester. Um, and the classes are a blend of synchronous as well as asynchronous work. Um, so of course the asynchronous, they're working at their own pace, making sure they understand the content. And then we do have live class sessions once roughly every other week um, for each oh, class cool. um, taught from our studio. Great, and I've been in your studio, so I know exactly where it is and what it looks like. Um, I want to talk a little bit about class profiles. Um, and, and since I have you here right now, I'm going to ask you, on your first cohort at Ross, how many people did you bring in and how many did you bring in the second time? Sure. So last year we brought in 72 students, so that was our initial intake. Um, and this year we are at 135 currently, um, so almost doubled um, the class size, the first, the first go round, which is very exciting. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of factors. We can't quite, you know, being that it's only our second year, we don't exactly have historical data to go off of. But, um, but I am sure that, you know, probably the pandemic has had something to do with students turning more towards an online format. Um, yeah. But we're really excited, and um, regardless of the number of students, we have kept our, our quality bar very high. Um, our students, you know, are coming in with roughly seven years of work experience on average. Um, average age puts them late 20s, early 30s. Um, CMAT average for incoming class was a 675, and GRE was a 159. Um, actually, 50% of our incoming class already holds a graduate degree. Um, so this is not their first go wrong with higher education. And of course, you know, GPAs are strong, 3-4 undergrad and 3-6 uh, for those that have a master's degree. So you went from 75 to 100 and what? 135. Wow, that's <laughs> impressive. Because at steady state, what do you expect to be at? Well, at steady state, we're hoping for 120 per cohort, um, but obviously we've, we've already sort of hit that bar um, again. And, and, you know, we won't know exactly, you know, what this year was. Is it a blip? Is it a trend? Is it all related to the pandemic? Um, so, you know, we need, 
we need sort of more intakes to tell whether or not this was um, just the massive growth in the program or if there are other factors influencing that. Right. Uh, Jessica, what is, it, what is the class profile at IE for your global online uh, MBA program? Yeah. That's what does that look question. like? Yeah, absolutely. So at any intake, like I said, you're looking to have somewhere around 60, 70 to 120 students. We usually have a maximum of four of those classes of 30 students. Um, of those, I could talk about last year's intake. We had over 50 different nationalities in the class. So one thing that we didn't mention about IE is one of our kind of key pillars and, and things that sets us apart is the diversity. So we have students from all over the world. Um, these offices we were talking about, that's how we, we recruit this talent to come to our different programs. So over 50 different na nationalities, students coming from uh, 32 plus different uh, countries of residence. And then going along with the theme of diversity, we have students from all different types of functional backgrounds, from different types of industries, and different educational backgrounds as well. So while you will see some that are kind of the larger players, like a, you know, a, a degree in, in business, or, or people working in um, marketing and sales as their function, or people in finance in terms of their industry, in general, it is a very diverse um, from class. The average age is gonna be somewhere around 31, 32 years old. Again, you need a minimum of three years of work experience for this program. Um, so you will have up to, you know, students with up to about 10, 11 years of experience, usually kind of at, at that middle point in their career where they're not yet holding any sort of um, high management positions or anything like that. This program is, is designed for students to really kind of excel into that next step in their career. Right, great. Um, in the gender split, uh, female, male, what, what does it look like at IE in the global online MBA program? Yeah, in any given intake, you're somewhere around, you know, uh, 65, 35. Um, we're aiming always for 30% for or so of, of women. Uh, we have a lot of different initiatives. I think like a lot of schools that are really trying to, to push the idea of having more women in our, our business classes because there's a lot of articles and studies out there that talk about how important having that opinion is in boardrooms. And so the way to get them into those boardrooms, of course, is to have them go through these top MBA programs as well. So Really true. So Gina, what does is, what is a class profile at <clears throat> Tepper look like for the online blended program? Yeah, I would say it's pretty similar to the full-time program, you know, strong GMAT score, about uh, 670 similar, um, or the median's about like 675 as well. Pretty comparable to the full-time program because again, we're viewing the admissions um, to, to the program overall. It's just the three different formats. Right. And uh, in terms of industry background, I'm thinking because it's Carnegie Mellon, just as it would be Imperial, that uh, you probably attract a higher percentage of engineers into your program than, let's say, Michigan Ross or IE. Is that true? Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with that. You know, I think that people with strong quant backgrounds do gravitate towards our school. However, um, I mean, we've had students with all different backgrounds. So, um, you know, we've had teachers and um, more liberal arts backgrounds as well. We, we feel we're going to teach you what you need to know. And I'm thinking your average age is probably higher than 31, 32. I, I'm gonna guess it's 37, am I right? I believe so. We, we don't necessarily break that out, but people in our part-time program do have 10 plus years of work experience. And again, they're continuing to work throughout this time as well. Great. And, and Joel, what kind of people do, uh, does your program attract? Well, listen, you know, I, I think it's worth mentioning uh, the broader MBA portfolio here. Uh, you know, we have obviously a full-time program, uh, but we have a weekend MBA, uh, the global MBA and an executive MBA. And so what you'd see from a profile perspective is that the online MBA, the, the global MBA is more similar to our weekend MBA. So typically about 10 years of experience on average is sort of about 34, uh, same sort of range of 30 to 40% female, uh, but certainly a real emphasis on people who are working in STEM uh, when they come into the program. And, you know, certainly I think with the global MBA, the typical profile that's joining the program is someone that's had a successful career in STEM and wants to move into senior leadership ranks. And we're gonna use the, the global MBA to fast track their sort of, uh, their process towards getting to a senior leadership role. 
Great. Uh, two quick questions from the audience, and then we'll continue here. And is your program currently only open to domestic students, given the residential requirement? Sure. So for the winter intake, yes, but for fall 2021, we will begin um, accepting international students. And that's the first time you'll accept international yep. students? In fall of 2021? Yep. Okay. And that application is currently live. All right. And then, uh, this is for Tepper, uh, are the tracks that are available in your full-time program also available in the part-time blended program like technology strategy and product management? Yeah, unfortunately not. Um, I'm not sure if plans in the future may lead to that, but we do offer eight different concentrations. Um, so I've always told students, you don't necessarily have to be in the product management track to end up being a product manager. So we do offer um, eight concentrations to our part-time students. Okay, great. And, and Jessica, because you are an actual graduate of the online global program at IE, uh, this question will be very easy for you. Uh, if I were to uh, ask your students, what were the three things about the online experience that most resonated with them, what would it be? That's a really good question. I could talk from my perspective, but trying to think about my classmates as well. <laughs> and that experience, I think one is absolutely the network and the people that you're doing the program with. Um, everyone underestimates, I think, the connections that you could build in an online program. And yes, our program does have those face-to-face -face periods, but so much of that bonding and that connecting happens online. So through the group work that you're doing, you know, people would even have their own Google Hangouts to like get together on a Thursday evening and have some drinks. I mean, there's really like a very social component to it that people don't think exists with an online MBA. So that is, I think, number one across the board is the connections that you're going to make. Um, the other thing I would say is actually how hands on it is. And like I was saying before, these, this is a program that's designed for working professionals but it is by no means a part-time program. You're going through the program day by day. If you're not actively working, you're thinking about you know, what case you're studying, you're thinking at a project, you're constantly getting together with your classmates to do different group work and different deliverables that you'll have. So really the hands-on experience um, that some people were surprised and, and really had that as, as one of the, the biggest takeaways. And then if I had to pinpoint one more thing, um, I think I would say the career impact. And so, so many people that I went through the program with um, it's one of those things where, and I'm sure my colleagues will have the same thing, it's harder to measure with an MBA, right? And I know we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but with an online MBA, it's a lot harder to measure. It's not they graduate and boom, we give them a survey three months out. The, the transitions happen at different periods of the time. Um, but so many of my classmates that I saw halfway through the program, they were really starting to take on different roles in their company, whether officially or unofficially. Um, and through that, they were promoted. I had classmates who transitioned to different companies, to different roles throughout the course of the program, and a number of them who did that shortly after. So I think some of them didn't expect the career impact to be so immediate. And once they started applying some of those, those things that they were learning in terms of, you know, not just the, the hard skills, but also the soft skills, their negotiating power, you know, their leadership abilities, they really were able to make that switch and have it an impact in their career very immediately. Right, that's great. Um, Joel, what, what would you say are the three things that people come away with out of your program uh, that seems to be special to them? Yeah, listen, you know, it's certainly not the full-time experience. Uh, but people right. do love going to London. And I think that being uh, at Imperial College, London's campus in South Kensington on Exhibition Road is an important part of the experience. And let me and just say, it's a beautiful campus. <laughs> It's very cool. It's right down from the Victoria and Albert Museum. When I visited there, there was a wonderful exhibit on Pink Floyd, uh, the rock band at v uh, v &A. It's It's a really lively, dynamic, beautiful neighborhood. Well, and, and speaking of rock bands, Queen's first performance yeah. was on campus at Imperial way back when. So, there's All like right, there you go. Trivia, people. <laughs> You're getting a, getting a real lead here, okay? What are the uh, other two things? The other two I would say is I think people underestimate uh, how much, how transformational the experience is going to be. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the difference in pedagogical approach. And you talked about this before, uh, John, but I think people still have not really a very clear understanding of the difference between full-time pedagogy or delivering a program that's designed to be given face-to-face full-time 
and a program that's designed to be delivered in an online format, a remote delivery or a mixed hybrid format. And they certainly are very different. And a lot of that difference has to do, you know, how and what kinds of tools you can use and you have at your disposition to, you know, meet those learning outcomes that students expect, uh, but also to do other things. And I think a lot of, you know, what's being talked about right now, in particular in the context of COVID-19, is how to use technology and digital services more uh, innovatively to deliver, you know, continuity of program, but also student experience. And so I think people are surprised by how all encompassing the experience is, regardless if it's a year or two year program. And then the final bit too is, you know, I, I think people uh, don't realize uh, really how beneficial it is to connect with people from so many different places and having that diversity of perspectives. And I think that's something you see perhaps in a global MBA program, you might not see in other programs more locally based. And certainly when you compare global MBA to say a part-time or weekend program, it really does give you access to a, a network and a group of perspectives that really does affect the learning experience. Great. Now, Gina, I'm imagining that the number one uh, item on your list of the three would be the access weekends. Am I right? Oh, I think you're on mute though, Gina. Sorry, I thought I unmuted. Absolutely, yeah. access weekends. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, we just, we really feel that's such an important aspect to bring <laughs> everyone together at that point. You know, as I mentioned, the interactions and the mentoring that you'll have with your leadership coach. It shouldn't just be those access weekends. It should be continuous throughout your MBA career. And that's really just enhancing those softer skills that we want to develop, the leadership skills. And with that comes the professional and personal growth that you'll have throughout your time as a student and then the career afterwards. Mm -hmm. And what are the other two things? I know. I, I was thinking, and I was never good with math, so um, I could probably only give you two more, but you know, the um, I, I think too, what attracts, yes, we have the, the engineers being attracted to our program, but those who don't come from that background, they do seek us out because they know that they're going to learn. They're, they're going to understand the, the data aspect. And I think, you know, more and more the data is so important within the business and technology world it's so intertwined that you know again going back to the leadership coaching the confidence that you'll have understanding it and being able to present it um, is just as valuable absolutely yeah and obviously in a school like Carnegie Mellon data analytics uh, are a central part of the experience and increasingly that is in great demand, that skill uh, by companies. And it's, uh, I mean, when you look over the last 10 years, one of the major changes in business education has been the move toward data analytics. Uh, now, Anne, obviously Ross is well known as a pioneer in experiential learning. <clears throat> and I'm thinking that among the three things that most resonate with your students has to be your attempt to bring experiential learning to the virtual world. Am I right there or am I wrong? <laughs> you are correct. Um, so uh, yeah, so we have been in the sort of leading um, experiential learning space for the last three decades, um, specifically with a signature program called MAP. It's an acronym that stands for our Multidisciplinary Action Project. Thank and that's you. where a team of students <laughs> yes, that's where a team of students um, essentially work as student consultants for a real organization. So we have an Office of Action-Based Learning who is constantly recruiting projects from companies where they would normally outsource to a McKinsey or a Deloitte um, to have a team come solve an issue for them. And instead, our students do that. So it gives the students an opportunity to put a different hat on, to look under the hood of a different organization, and specifically for those who are looking maybe to switch careers, it might give them exposure to a different functional area in a different industry and try that out while they're continuing to work and keep their regular job um, to see if this is something that they're interested in. Um, now let me so, talk a little bit about yeah. that. You know, in your full-time MBA program, what makes your experiential learning unique is both the length of it, but also the fact that you literally break the academic calendar so that people who are engaged in the experiential learning uh, exercise are not going to classes for the traditional MBA. They're completely focused on the project that they're working on. Do you do the same thing in your online MBA or not? So in the online MBA, MAP is a 14-week um, experience. 
similar to what it is for our evening, weekend, and executive program. So it runs the full semester. Um, and typically in our weekend and our executive program, students are taking other courses. But with the online MBA, the flexibility, we assume that most people were, are only taking one class at a time. So when they are taking the math program, then likely that is going to be their focus. Right. And then, then the other two things that you think really uh, make the program stand out or what? Sure. So um, I would also say our residencies, so similar to, to CMU in terms of, you know, the, the on-campus or in-person portion. Uh, we only have three that are required over the course of the program. Um, but uh, from the feedback that we've gotten from the students who joined last year and participated in our first residency, it was absolutely transformational for them. Um, they got to see each other in person, um, you know, network with one another, as well as other students at Ross. So not just online MBA students, they were working in teams with full-time MBAs um, on some of their, their workshop experiences. So they're sort of able to expand their network beyond just the 72 students in the cohort, um, which was really valuable. Um, and I think probably the third thing that makes our program pretty special is that we treat our online MBA students uh, just like any other MBA student in terms of career services. So our students have the full access of uh, the Career Development Office, um, helping them, whether they're looking to make a career pivot or a transition, or, or simply to leverage their MBA internally and advance at their company. Um, so we have the full, full team of folks waiting and ready to help students in whatever that next career step looks, looks like for them. Great. Now, all four schools are big brands in the market. Um, so these are not inexpensive programs. Uh, do all four schools have scholarship money available for, for students? And if you do, do you do it by merit or need or both? And since you're up, why don't you, you answer? Sure. So yes, we do have scholarship money um, and all students are considered for that when they apply to the program. Um, so you will be notified in your admission letter if you were to be offered um, some sort of scholarship. Now to be fair, they're not giant. Um, they range typically in the five to $25,000 range, um, which brings our price point down um, you know, a little bit, but certainly not, not full rides. Um, and then also a lot of our students um, do have company sponsorship um, because they can take to work so that's an additional resource that helps them fund their MBA and they are eligible for financial aid which most of them take. And I should point out something that's actually obvious here right uh, because people in online MBA programs are fully employed and earning their paycheck uh, there is frankly less a need for financial aid uh, and in many cases there's some sponsorship from companies so it's quite different from a full-time MBA program where you quit your job you no longer have income and you're probably not going to get sponsored. Although, of course, there are companies that do sponsor uh, people in full-time MBA programs with a proviso that they come back to their employer and put in a certain number of years before uh, that loan gets completely forgiven. Uh, Joel, uh, do you have scholarship money available for students or no? <clears throat> yeah, we, we do, uh, and that would apply to all postgraduate programs at Imperial College Business School. Uh, and generally, there is certainly a balance between uh, you know, pure financial need and merits, uh, with you know, merits being an important decision factor in most cases. I think that the one advantage for online programs, because you are working, and typically you're working in a market where you can establish credit history, it is easier to get a uh, you know, student loan because you have income coming in during the program as well. So Good point. Good point. from a complementary funding perspective, scholarships are certainly an option, but being able to access loans and what is a generally quite you know, complicated, broader market context right now, you probably have a better chance of obtaining a loan because you will have continued income throughout the program. Yeah, good point. Jessica? Yeah, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but we also have financial aid opportunities okay. available for students. Um, need and merit-based as well, a combination of the two. And the one thing I would just add, we also have um, some agreements for scholarship opportunities, I mean, for, for student loans, which people think if they're going abroad, that may not be an option. But I also wanted to add, along with the idea that you are going to have a stable income during the program, another thing that we're somewhat flexible on is working with you for payment options. So because you're going to have that income throughout the program, we could help you spread those payments out as well to make it a little bit more feasible. But of course, you could also apply for financial aid. And if you, there's a little bit of a gap there that you'd like to fill, we could talk to you about options for, for student loans also. 
great. And Gina? Yeah, I'd like to echo what my colleagues have stated as well. And similar to uh, Michigan Ross, you know, it, it is merit-based scholarship for us as well. Again, um, the average tends to be about 15,000, but um, the, because the majority of our part-time students are domestic students, they would be eligible for financial aid and loans that way. Right, and I just point out too that all of these schools are very good at helping you negotiate with your employer. So uh, there are experts at all of these schools who tell you how to approach your employer, even if they don't have a sponsorship program. Uh, there are ways to get money from your company. Um, and, you know, sometimes you're successful, sometimes not. Um, but all of these schools have experts to, to tell you how to approach your company, how to sell them on it. Uh, because after all, your company is going to benefit from the education because the beauty of an online MBA program is that what you learn in the classroom today can be applied tomorrow at your job. Uh, and you can make a very strong argument that, hey, you know, they should be investing in you because they're going to get an immediate return uh, based on the education you're receiving. Let's talk a little bit about some of the misgivings that most people have about online MBA programs, even blended programs. Um, one common perception is that, well, I'm not going to really develop the kind of connections with my classmates or my professors that I would in an on-campus environment. And let's face it, the network, those connections are vital to a good MBA experience. Joel, you want to take on that misperception? Well, I, I, I actually, this is a great question. I'm glad I've been able to jump in here. Uh, I'm a bit of a lifelong studier myself, and I have studied in pretty much all formats and across several different institutions, full-time, part-time, online, executive. And I think that like many things, regardless of the format, it's what you make out of it. Um, I will say though, that for the online programs I've done, there's this interesting thing that happens. Uh, so when you're in a full-time program, everyone's you know shoulder to shoulder for the 12 months or whatever the duration is and you are sort of very comfortable maintaining those relationships. And then for very international programs, everyone goes back to their home countries or third countries. And then the most expensive part of your MBA becomes all those wedding invites you inevitably get after the program because you have to fly all over the world. Uh, for online programs, uh, everyone is physically sort of dispersed from the get-go. And so you learn how to build you know, strong relationships with your syndicate groups and the broader class profile from, from, from day one. And so even as you work through the program and into graduation, you're so used to managing those relationships using technology uh, that it's sort of a natural progression afterwards. And I would, I would even venture to say that if there was a study done that uh, students who go through a global MBA probably are better at keeping in touch with their fellow cohort uh, mates after graduation than full-time because you're so used to managing that, that relationship from that perspective. Yeah, and I can just say that, you know, we obviously have a ranking on online MBA programs. It's currently domestic, we wanna make it global, but I will say this about uh, the ranking. We survey graduates of all the online MBA programs that are in the ranking and, we, and our sample rate's very high. And we ask them this question and surprisingly, they feel that uh, the connections that they've made are far in excess of what they ever expected. Uh, I wanna talk about another misconception, which would be, uh, I'm gonna make a sacrifice on the career side, because while I may be able to use the learning in my current job, it may be more difficult for me to make a career switch. A lot of people who go into uh, full-time MBA programs go in there to pivot their career. They wanna change your discipline, they may wanna change your industry, they may even wanna change your geography or to do the so-called triple jump and do all three at one time. Um, the feeling is that online MBA programs are really better suited for the uh, person who wants to accelerate their career where it currently is. Uh, Jessica, do you have a view on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I'm not sure if it was ever true what you're saying, but it definitely seems like something that has been a myth for a while. And at least now it's, it's very far from the truth. I think there's many reasons why someone would want to do an online MBA. And that could range from, yes, professional growth within their own company, which is that traditional path you were talking about, 
but that could also be, you know, personal reasons. You have a family that you don't want to leave for a year and you don't want to have that time commitment. It could be funding. You'd like to have that steady income. You have a mortgage or you bought a boat, you know, who knows what, what you're spending your money on, but you have that need for a constant income, right? So there's a lot of different reasons. And I have seen personally, I mean, alumni of ours who've gone on and started up their own startup after coming from the corporate world and getting those skills through an online MBA program. I had a classmate who did that notorious triple dump during the program and he was saying, I don't think I can make it. You know, I don't think I can make it. Um, but with everything, the more we're given, the more we're able to handle, right? So he was able to do that. He moved back to the country he was originally from. He took on a new position, a new functional role and in a new industry. He did that all while continuing the program. Wow. Um, so it's definitely a possibility. Again, when those, those kind of jumps and those career changes happen, it's going to vary a lot more with an online MBA um, because you're not stopping and starting. But that those transitions could happen during the program. They could happen shortly after. Or those could be skills that you could use and, and change within a few years. Um, I think the big thing there, and this goes to, to one of Joel's points as well, is it really matters what, how, what you do with the experience and what you make of it. So if you're thinking you're going into the program and you know, you know you're not going to do a full-time program, but you do want to make one of those transitions, make the most of the program, network with your classmates to find out about their industries, their sectors, maybe there's an opportunity there. Connect with the different groups and, and associations and you know, activities that happen on campus because those are all open to our online students as well. So get involved in those things throughout the experience. That's definitely gonna broaden your kind of your scope and give you more possibilities to make some of those changes. Right, all good points. Uh, here's another misgiving, uh, Gina. It's, um, it concerns the alumni network. If you graduate from an online MBA program, are you a second rate citizen in your MBA community or not? Or are you an equal member with a full-time MBA crew, the executive MBA crew, a part-time part evening program or whatever a school may have? You are an alum. There's no, uh, no difference, <laughs> you know? And I think, again, to echo what's already been said, um, you know, the, the alumni network is so important to have. And I think um, because, you know, especially because our class sizes are smaller, you really get to know your, your class, but also the class above. And as you progress, you're, you're getting to know those uh, in the class under you. But you're invited to the alumni events as well. And you network, you know, keep expanding that network. Talk to people, maybe ask them how they got to where they are. And so the alumni network is very important to maintain. But also if you are working while you're in our part-time program, you know, don't forget about your current network as well. You never know where your path is going to lead you throughout this time, whether, you know, changing jobs during the program or progressing afterwards as well. And I should point out that you get the same degree. The, the, the diploma that you get is an MBA. It's not an online MBA. And that's true across all online MBA programs generally. Yeah. Now, Ian, here's the last and final misgiving. If I take an online MBA, it's going to be a no frills program. In other words, I'm going to get accounting. I'm going to get finance. I'll get strategy. I'll get marketing. But, you know, I may be getting uh, less leadership development uh, as a person in an online MBA program than I would get in a more traditional MBA format. Is that true? Absolutely not. So our students, um, you know, through the residential uh, portions, through the MAP experience, um, we have, they're, they're welcome to participate in our living business leadership experience, which is another um, action-based experiential learning um, course. They have uh, Ross Leaders Academy, so they are welcome and encouraged to participate in all and any of these types of extra curriculars that will help round out their experience. Um, so it's not always just about the coursework, it's also about the extracurriculars. And again, to sound like a broken record, you know, you, you get out what you put in in these programs. And so if you are trying to make a pivot, if you are trying to develop those leadership skills, then make sure that you set yourself up for success by joining the types of clubs and organizations that are going to give you that extra exposure and practice um, and so that you're taking what you're learning and applying it, you know, your leadership lessons in your daily work and potentially in, in future employment opportunities. And do you have an executive coaching available for your online students? 
Yep, so through our career services offering, it is a very individualized, tailored approach. So we have um, coaches who will work with the students one on one in terms of, you know, identifying what their needs are, um, again, and whether that's pivoting or advancing, um, or simply just to be better, a better leader in their current organization. Um, okay, so all of you, all of you have convinced me that my misgivings are misplaced. Uh, so now the question is, my goodness, can I really do this? I'm married. My spouse works. I have two kids, one's in diapers, and I have a demanding job. How in the world am I going to do this? Joel? <laughs> so that's certainly the, uh, the Superman, Superwoman scenario. Um, one of the things you talked about before was, you know, financial support from your organization. Another thing that candidates often forget to ask for is, is uh, time sponsorship. And so asking for your employer, uh, if they're not willing to provide you financial backing to say, we'll give you this amount of time to work on your program, which can be very good. And students that have, you know, a spouse, kids, full-time job and all these other things can be very effective with those short spurts of time that, that the, uh, the office can give them to work on the program as well. But I would say also that uh, people that go through the global MBA experience, inevitably upon graduation feel like, oh, I just have a full-time job. And they often return to studies because they've gotten so good at managing their time and, and sort of juggling all those responsibilities at once. Right. And I'm imagining that uh, in some cases you can tailor uh, some of the stuff that you do at work into the program, getting the advice of the faculty, getting the advice of your colleagues in the program, uh, so that it's not completely, totally separate the way it would be in a normal MBA situation. Um, Jessica, since you had to grapple with these issues and in, in, in balance in your own life and whatever job you had when you went through the program, uh, do you have a personal observation about this, uh, a story you might be able to share? Yeah, so I, I just had a, I have my first child about nine months ago. She's a little over nine months, but I didn't have her at the time of the program. And I think it's one of those things where, you know, they say if you, big, you buy a big house, you'll fill a big house. If you buy a small apartment, you'll fill a small apartment. You will make do with however amount of time and things that you have. There's this saying that says, um, if you want something done, give it to somebody who's busy because they'll make time for it and they'll prioritize. Um, in, my, in my case, it felt like I had so many things going on. So the story is not about myself, but actually I had a colleague who was in the Philippines and he had two children. You know, he was a very successful at a professional career as well. And, he, and what he did is he was actually taking the classes at the same time as I was here on the, the East Coast of the U.S., he was taking his classes at night so that he would get everything done, you know, in his downtime while his children were asleep. He didn't have to sacrifice that time. And then during the day, you know, he was there with them. So I think we know it, there is a sacrifice that you have to make. I think when you go through any sort of transformational experience, you will have to make a, a, a sacrifice. And there will be times when you feel like you're just going to break. Uh, but that's how you grow and that's how you move forward. And so whether it's having your child bust in, we had that happen as well as a colleague, that like infamous CNN video, you know, we had that happen during a class where someone's child comes running in the background. I mean, we're all people, we understand you have your personal life as well. And I think you're able to, to, to do as much as you can with what you have. I think you have to make the decision that you're gonna prioritize school when you have to prioritize school and there's things that have to be done. Um, but it's a limited amount of time. And, and like Joel said, once you finish, it's almost like a car that the motor's still running. It's still hot when you stop. So you're like, what do I have to do? What do I need to go? I should be doing something. You know, all I have to do is work and take care of my kids. And so you really get used to managing your time in, in a specific way. And, and I should mention that generally, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, uh, uh, someone in an online MBA program can expect to spend between 15 and 20 hours a week uh, doing doing the work, and obviously, if you if you have a mandatory in residence uh, kind of session, you're going to be all in when you're there and not being able to do anything else, obviously. Um, but pretty much, that's the commitment: fifteen to twenty hours a week. Am I right? Yeah, I see everyone nodding their head. That's good. Um, so, okay, you convinced me. I, I think I can handle this. I got two kids, the wife, but you know, you, you totally convinced me. So now what? How do I make the right choice for me? How do I, how do I um, get a handle on fit? What program is best for me? Uh, is there in fact an ideal candidate for any one of your programs? And you want to tackle that? 
Sure. Yeah. So I think I think first and foremost, um, you know, we're looking for students who are smart and hardworking, right? Um, you know, our 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 curriculum is very rigorous, so you have to be able, to, you know, have the academic acumen to be able to keep up in the coursework. Um, and and to your point, 15 to 20 hours a week, finding that is is a challenge and it's hard, and you need to um, to allocate that. So the students are going to need to be willing to to put in the extra work. Um, our our all of our programs, including our online program, um, is no exception, require a great deal of teamwork. So we're looking for candidates who are good team players, um, understand how um, to navigate team dynamics. Um, so that's definitely something that's going to be a signature component of our program. Um, we are, we're looking for people who are driven, who are motivated, um, they show initiative and leadership. So whether that's professionally or extracurricularly, they're pushing themselves outside of the boundaries. Um, and of course, they need to come to the program with a learner's mindset. They wouldn't be in the program if they knew everything, right? So they need to open themselves up to the faculty expertise, to the expertise of their fellow classmates in terms of, you know, what they're, what they're able to learn from each other um, and in turn be willing to share. I mean, it's an engaging program. You do have to, um, you know, put yourself out there and, and share with your classmates your area of expertise um, and in turn learn from them. So they're, they're sort of lifelong learners. And you know, the dirty little secret of every good MBA program is you learn more from your classmates than you do from your professors. I would concur. So crafting the class is, is a real skill um, that brings tremendous value to every MBA program, whether it's in person or online. Gina, what's your advice to someone who's looking at the different options out there and trying to figure out what is best for him or her? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what you can do is just talk to student ambassadors, you know, ask them um, about their experiences in the MBA program, whether it is uh, part time online or full time, you know, try and just hear and learn about their stories. Also, uh, reach out to alums as well. You know, they're obviously going to have a different perspective now that they've been working for a couple years. How has that degree helped them? But when you're looking as, as well at the other programs, where are the students going? Um, where, where are they heading towards for jobs? Um, you know, is that where, is, is that where you want to see yourself in that a particular industry? You know, look at the career services website and, and look at that information. I think that'll help determine too, if a school is right for you. Also, um, class sizes, you know, again, we're a smaller school compared to others, you know, do you want, um, how best do you learn? And again, you can figure out the class structures by talking to the current students as well. Yeah, that's all good advice. Joel, do you have anything special to add? <laughs> well, listen, you know, the, uh, like, you know, my other colleagues here, the, the admissions process is quite selective and, you know, certainly at Imperial, there's sort of this multi-stage approach where, you know, Central College has to prove the candidate. Then it comes to the faculty of the business school, and then we look at them and how they fit into the profile. So there's a standard sort of uh, profile information that's obviously important to understand what schools require and what the broader universities require. Uh, but I, if I had to sort of give some a unique perspective here, I would say that one of the things you should think about as, as a candidate to a, an MBA program at a top business school is think about sort of the personal branding aspect and think about what, what brand is it you want to associate your profile with and what does that school stand for? You know, I think at Imperial College Business School, because of our parent university that really is focused on I guess, sort of pure STEM focus, you know, we are the business school that sort of is at that intersection of STEM and business. Uh, and, you know, there are some quant subjects that go beyond STEM business, just finance, where we do quite well as well. But for the MBA, I would say that, you know, think about, you know, a school that is sort of focusing on STEM and business and the challenges around sort of digital transformation. And if that's something that's attractive to you, then Imperial College Business School might, might be a good fit for you, just as there are other schools that are more, say, you know, consulting schools or finance schools, et cetera. So think about, you know, the longer term brand association between what the business school stands for and the parent university and where you want to build your career out. Maybe choose a school that will communicate that specific aspect of what, what your ambitions are from a professional perspective. Great point. Uh, last words. Jessica, you went through this process yourself. Um, what process did you go through in choosing IE's global online MBA program? Yeah, I think my, my experience is a little bit different, but I think I'll talk in, in general. I think one thing that hasn't been touched upon and 
uh, is thinking about that, you know, the experience that you want to have. Do you want to have an international experience? And how is that going to translate to your career afterwards? You know, are you looking for a, a very local network? You'd like to kind of increase your contacts locally. What does the alumni base look like? Where are the alumni base? Not just looking at what they're doing, but where are they physically? You know, do, are you looking for a career where you may be able to have that opportunity to move around? Um, in my case, I have a love affair with Spain. And so having those face-to-face -face periods in Madrid and also being able to tighten that connection, but being to have, able to have those international connections as well that, you know, who knows where I may end up in the future. Um, maybe I will end up traveling to somewhere else, living in Singapore. Well, there's a, an alumni community there that's there to welcome me. When I moved to Miami, I had that happen. You know, some of my very close friends came through the alumni network that we have here on a personal level, but also on a professional level. You know, we're, we're there to support each other and, and help each other as well. So thinking of what you see in your future, uh, you know, not just in terms of sector, but, you know, are you open to international moves? Do you want to have a job that you're going to have that international perspective as well? Great. Hey, listen, I had great fun with all of you. Uh, I think we got a lot of great information out there. Uh, I want to uh, leave all four with the thought that think about how different uh, all of these four different experiences actually are. Um, each unique in its own way, uh, which, which makes the diversity of programs available to you uh, even better than you can ever imagine. And uh, I want to thank Joel, Jessica, Anne, and Gina for a terrific session. I want to remind everyone that um, all four of these folks are now committed to be in a, a breakout room for half an hour. You can ask them any questions you'd like uh, and get any other additional information that you need. Um, so thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And hope to see you soon. Hope to see all of you soon. I've been on each of these campuses. I love all of them. <laughs> this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants backstage at our online MBA admissions and program event. Uh, stay tuned. Go into a breakout room with our folks here. Uh, and our next webinar, um, you can check the schedule. It'll be right around the corner. A pleasure. <laughs>